Okay, let's see. Can we get started? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. So we're very happy to have uh, Miguel Montero from Harvard, who's gonna tell us about uh, non-invertible symmetries and completeness of the spectrum. So whenever you're ready, Miguel, thanks very much. All right, uh, well, first, thanks a lot uh, to Jonathan, Ivo, and the other organizers for the kind of opportunity to speak here. Tell us about the recent, I'll tell you about the recent work that I did in collaboration with Ben Heidenreich, Jake McNamara, Matt Reese, Tom Rudilius, and Irene Valenzuela. So this is the QFT and geometry seminar series. So this talk accordingly is gonna be mostly about quantum field theories. But the kind of questions that we would like to explore about quantum field theories are motivated by thinking about quantum gravity. So before I get down to the, to the main topic of the talk, I'm gonna, give, I'm gonna tell you like a few words about why we're thinking about this kind of things. And it's the, 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 the bigger set of ideas known as the Swamp Land Program. Um, so there's, uh, there's, there's been several reviews about the Swamp Land so far. The most recent one is uh, by Irene and friends. And I think it's based on, um, on a lecture series which was given uh, in, the, in the context of this seminar series. So it's, you, you should have a look at this for more information. So what is the Swamp Land Program? Well, you can think of the space of all quantum field theories and let's think of all you know, quantum field theories uh, as a low energy effective field theory. So we have a cutoff and we allow non-renormalizable operators. We can draw it as some sort of blob like this. Um, the basic idea behind the Swamp Land Program is we want to understand which quantum field theories can arise as the low energy limit of a consistent quantum gravity theory. And it starts from the observation that you cannot just get anything in this way. You can just get a, a reduced set of possibilities. So people who work in the swamp land, what we try to do is we try to figure out which effective field theories can arise as in this way as from coupling to quantum gravity versus the ones which cannot. And the way we do this in practice, we try to produce constraints, things that properties that we believe the theories that are in the uh, in the landscape here must satisfy versus theories that uh, that that can be in the swamp. Okay, so that's the idea of the swamp plan. and of course it's very difficult. It's basically impossible to rigorously establish any of these constraints. We can do it sometimes in some particular contests, like in ADS CFT or perturbative string theory, or sometimes we can prove that a given Constraint holds in a very large class of examples in string theory. But we cannot really prove them in general because we just don't have a framework to prove things in general in quantum gravity. And so the best thing that we can do, given that we don't have uh, such a framework, is to gather as much evidence as we can for the statements that we think are true and organize them into a series of interconnected conjectures. So these are statements with different degrees of support and validity. Uh, but the fact that they are all connected to each other gives solidity to the overall picture. Okay, so you see some famous conjectures here, like the weak gravity conjecture or the swamp land distance conjecture. But today's talk is going to be about these two guys in the top corner, which are some of the old best established uh, conjectures in the swamp land, the completeness hypothesis and the absence of global symmetries. So that's in a nutshell the broader picture of what we're going to be talking about. And this is how I'm going to be doing it. So the talk is about the relationship between uh, completeness hypothesis and absence of global symmetries. So I will start with a review of what higher form global symmetries are. Then I'll discuss what the completeness of the spectrum is and discuss the, the relation that these two have in a simple example. And then we'll move to a particular, to studying the relation between these two things in a particular interesting example, that of O2 gauge theory where we'll see that naively these two things are, um, are not, um, um, they're, they're, they're not, uh, there's a nice interplay between them. And thinking about the O2 gaze theory is gonna lead us to introduce a new notion, which is the idea of, uh, it's a generalization of the idea of global symmetry, that's that of non-invertible global symmetries. And actually the main stuff that we're gonna be able to prove is that in a particular setup for a particular um, set of symmetries, Having uh, demanding that there's that there are no non-invertible global symmetries on, on the spectrum is the same as requiring that the spectrum is complete in a certain sense. So that's like the main course uh, of the talk, and then I'll end with some additional comments and limitations to the uh, to the to the statement that we prove originally. Okay. So this is the basic idea. 
before I go on, there's a very important announcement that I need to make before we get started, which is that you should please interrupt me at any point with questions, comments whatsoever. Uh, it's particularly important in a Zoom talk, right? As we know very well by now. Uh, so please interrupt me, okay? At any point with anything. Okay, so let's get started then. What is a global symmetry? Well, at this most basic level, a global symmetry, we, we know what it is, you know, from, from the undergrad in quantum mechanics, just an operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian. Or if, if you prefer, you can trade this Hermitian operator that commutes with the Hamiltonian by a family of unitary operators that satisfy a group law, uh, which also commute with the Hamilton. Okay. And they give you selection rules and all sorts of nice things. So that's what a global symmetry is in quantum, in, in, in quantum mechanics. What is a symmetry in quantum field theory? Well, if you're doing quantum field theory, you want to covariantize the above, right? So you got to covariantize this equation. And to do that, you better replace the Hamiltonian by the stress energy tensor. And if we choose to write things in terms of unitary operators rather than, than, the, than the symmetry generators, then what we get is that you get, um, you get a set of unitary operators that depend on some group element G. So here G is a placeholder for what I wrote as theta. Here is just, it's just emphasizing that this operator satisfy a group law. And because in quantum mechanics, in canonical quantization, you foliate space time by co-dimension one surfaces, the unitary operators, when you do it in a Lorentz or, or in a Euclidean invariant way, they're naturally gonna be defined in co-dimension one surfaces, okay? So the natural extension of a global symmetry to quantum field theory involves these unitary operators defining co dimension one surfaces. And the fact that they are, they don't see the stress energy tensor because the stress energy tensor is the generator of infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. What it means is that these operators are actually topological operators, okay? So the model understanding of what a global symmetry is, is that you have a symmetry, means that you have a certain class of topological operators which satisfies some sort of group law. Okay, so that's 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 the basic gist of what a global symmetry is. And once you you put things in this way, then there's no reason to stop at co-dimension one. You can try to define symmetry operators, which which live in higher co-dimension uh, manifolds. And this is what was done in this paper. These guys uh, they received the name of generalized global symmetries. They're just like ordinary global symmetries, but they, they, the unitary operators live in higher co-dimension manifolds. Okay. Um, when you're talking about the symmetry, the symmetry, it's the topological operators are only part of the story. It's boring if you have a set of topological operators and they don't talk to anyone. So there's a set of operators they talk to, uh, a particular set of operators, which is, the, the, which is called the set of charge operators. In the same way that these guys are labeled by group elements, the unitary operators, uh, the polygon unitary operators are labeled by group elements. The charge operators are labeled by representations of the group, and uh, they live in dimension and uh, p-dimensional of manifolds of the theory. So, why do they live in p-dimensional of manifolds of the theory? Well, when they live in p-dimensional of manifolds, they have the right dimension to link non-trivially with this, with this, uh, with these symmetry operators. Okay. Uh, questions so far? Okay. So what do I mean that they are able to link with symmetry operators? Well, what I mean is that when one says that the operators are topological, they're really topological, the, the, the insertions of these operators, except when they cross charge operators. So that's the extra bit that makes talking about the correlators of these operators something untrue. So suppose you have a situation like this where you have the operator linking uh, like this and you can start deforming the operator, which you can do because it's a topological operator that doesn't change the value of the correlator. And at some point, the topological operator hits the, the charge operator. And when it does, the correlator changes. It, it, you, you, it, gets, uh, it, gets, uh, it gets a particular um, additional factor, which is a natural pairing between the group element, the data that defines this operator, a group element, and the data that defines this operator, which is a representation. So you get rho of G, okay? And so once you, when that, that's the most that can happen with these correlators. 
And once you cross, you can keep on shrinking this guy to a point if you want. And you get that the original correlator with the original insertion of the topological operator is equal to this other thing. So that's how you treat correlators with these topological operators. Okay. So just to briefly recap uh, what I've discussed so far, uh, ordinary P from global symmetry means that the theory contains these operators and they're leaving what I mentioned piece of manifolds. They satisfy a group law and they are topological unless they hit the charge operator in a dimension, in a p dimensional space. Okay. Good. So an example of this, uh, very quickly, is the free Maxwell theorem for plus one dimensions. It's a famous example of a theory with one form global symmetries. Um, for, uh, there's two kinds of, of one form symmetries for this theory. There's an electric one form symmetry where the topological operators are um, are given by these integrals of the of the field strengths, and the corresponding charge operators are just the Wilson lines. Uh, so this 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 is a phase which takes values between zero and two pi, and this is an integer. And they they um, the, uh, the you, you can check that this operator is topological unless it hits one of these guys. Similarly, you have a magnetic symmetry involving magnetic operators and tough lines. But we will be mostly talking about the first one uh, in this talk. OK, so that's basically what a global symmetry is. And so far, the discussion has been completely field theoretic. But now we have the first input from quantum gravity. In field theory, you care about global symmetries because they, um, uh, you know, they are nice. They provide word identities. They provide selection rules. They constrain energy flows uh, via tough anomaly matching. Uh, but from the point of view of quantum gravity, um, symmetries are interesting precisely because of the opposite reason, because they are not supposed to be there. One is not supposed to have any global symmetries in any low energy effective theory coupled to quantum gravity. This idea that there are no global symmetries is perhaps the oldest one line constraint. Apparently, there are statements along these lines uh, uh, from Wheeler from the 50s. And it certainly has a, a, a lot of support. First of all, you can prove it under certain assumptions using ADS CFT. There are arguments from black hole physics involving black hole remnants and the like. Um, you can also prove it in perturbative string theory. And it's true in every string example that we know of. So this one is very, I would say, is one of the most solid uh, swamp line constraints. Are, are there any questions about this? I have a question about. Please. About this. Yeah. Um, yes, is the hi hello. Is the is the program about proving the no glo no global symmetry in quantum gravity? Is it more about proving that they don't exist, or is it more about how to even define them in quantum gravity? <laughs> yes. like, because the way you present it, the way in, you introduce global symmetry is via this topological operators and. All the informations are encoded in how different operators are linked to each other. But in quantum gravity, we sum over topologies. Very good. Okay, so it's you're not even clear how we define them in the first place. And if we cannot define them in the first place, it's a little bit confusing how to prove that they don't exist. Very good. Yes. So actually, you kind of jumped to one of the last slides. Yeah. In, in yeah. But yes. So indeed, in, in, I have no idea what quantum gravity is outside of, I personally don't have any idea what it is outside of ADS CFT. There, I think I have more or less of a handle, but yes, you have to sum over topologies. It's, it's not even clear what you mean. Right. But one thing that you can do, and which makes sense, is to focus on particular backgrounds of, uh, of weakly coupled uh, solutions of Einstein's gravity. So you, you can look at the low energy effective field theory. The low energy effective field theory is a quantum field theory. And there you can talk about global symmetry. So the statement is that the things that you define there, right, the operators you define there actually have to be able to break. And mm -hmm. that is an untrivial statement, even at the level of the quantum field theory. If I say that you have, um, for instance, a Wilson line and the Wilson line can break, um, that's a statement that makes sense inside the quantum field theory. The point is that the quantum field theory is, is, is you should think of it as a quantum field theory with a cutoff. So when you're saying that the Wilson line ends, you're saying that it ends on some sort of blob which has size given by the cutoff and you don't really know what's happening there but you do know that there has to be possible that in this particular background for this particular low energy effective field theory where you're not doing crazy things with gravity it better be that this line can end and that's a well-defined statement and that's the statement we're interested in okay thank you uh okay yeah 
So again, I got that a little bit ahead of myself. So there are no global simulation no learning effective field theory. And uh, what, what does it mean? What this means, of course, is that these operators that we have here must fail to be topological. And one very simple way that the operators can fail to be topological is uh, because the corresponding charge operators can break, OK? Um, so I'm going to illustrate this now. And this is one of, I think, one of the basic ideas that underlines this, this talk. Um, so suppose that you have a uh, line operator. So, so this is the picture that I had before, right? With the topological operator and the charge operator. And as I've argued before, it's equal to this other thing where I remove the charge operator and instead have this row of G. Good. So suppose now that the operator, uh, so this, this equality is true if the operator is topological. Now suppose that the operator, that the, that the charge operator is actually endable. It can end in some line operator. Then you can imagine splitting the operator a little bit at a point, like just a little bit. You don't want to change the correlator. You, you want to change the correlator only by an arbitrary small amount. So you just open it a little bit. And once you open it a little bit, you can move this operator like this. You can make the same kind of moves that we we're making before, except that in that now you avoid intersecting the charge line operator. So you're not picking any phase. And then you can close back in if you want. And so the conclusion that you reach is that as an operator equation, because what we did here doesn't care about what other operator instructions could have been elsewhere in, uh, in the, um, um, you know, in the clean correlation function that we're computing, what you get is that this thing is equal to this thing. And that is just not true if this phase is not trivial. So that's a contradiction. There must have been some wrong assumption. And indeed, the wrong assumption that we have was that the operator was topological in the first place. The conclusion is that whenever you have an operator like this, which links with a breakable line, it can never be topological. OK? But Good. can it be that this phase rho g is uh, trivial? It's just one? Best, yes, 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 of course, that can happen. This is only a counterargument if the phase is not trivial. Yes, yes, yes. So, so the topological operator might exist. It just doesn't act on anything. Uh, well, okay, fine. Uh, right. So you could also say, okay, like have a topological operator that doesn't act, doesn't link with any operator in my theory. That one could still be topological, right? Yes. Um, uh, I agree. Uh, but that operator is kind of like it has. It's basically the identity operator, right? If you have a topological operator, you can always deform to nothing, and has non-trivial correlators. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Good. So, very good. So we see how one way to break the global symmetry is by having these endable line operators. And that really plays well with another swamp line constraint, which I'm going to introduce now, which is the completeness hypothesis. So the completeness hypothesis tells us that, is loosely, loosely speaking, it tells you that the spectrum of charge states should be complete. You should have states of every physical charge. And when you say it like that, it sounds like it's a pretty nice, well-defined thing. But then you start thinking, and it's a little bit more subtle because, I mean, how do you define, like, let's say, like, in, let's say you have Maxwell theory, then, then maybe electric completeness tells you that you must have states of charge one, two, or three. But if you just have a spectrum which has charges which are multiples of three, can't you just redefine the charge so that that is one? So, you know, it's not really that very well defined. So, luckily for us, there's a more precise version which is completely well defined which is the idea that all extended operators in the field should be endable, okay? Which you could call the principle of, uh, of total completeness. So why, what, what, does, what does the physical states of every, having states of every chart have to do with completeness? Well, to see this, we can consider the simple case when you have a Wilson line that doesn't some sort of operate on, on some operator. Then by doing a gauge transformation on this configuration, you, you, can, you basically easily conclude that the operator, the local operators in which the line ends are charged. They are operators kind of like the fermion bilinears that you would construct the Lagrangian of a charge Dirac fermion with, or they are, they are charge operators. And so they create charge states. This is, a, this is perhaps a simple example to make it familiar, uh, but actually the argument is pretty general and you can argue it in a very simple way if you, if you take the perspective that the Wilson line or an extended operator it's actually, what it's doing is inserting the word volume of a probe object that is not part of the dynamical degrees of freedom of the theory, but you just introduce as a probe uh, and you study correlators in the presence of this object. 
So saying that the object can end, it can end is like, like saying that uh, by the state operator mapping that the Hilbert space on this sphere that I drew here is non-empty. But why is the Hilbert space on the sphere? Well, if you think about it, because it's, inter it's, it's intersecting this line, that's the Hilbert space where you introduce a defect charge. If you, if you go again to talk about Wilson lines, this is like saying that you have a, uh, this is like saying that you're doing electrodynamics on a sphere and you're putting a probe particle of charge Q. Now, you cannot just put a particle of charge Q in a compact space uh, because that violates Gauss's law. So the Hilbert space, if you try to do that, is empty unless there are dynamical degrees of freedom in the theory that can say, oh, you're putting a charge Q, so I'm going to get charge minus Q so that you satisfy Gauss's law. So in other words, uh, very generally, having, oper having operators being able to end means that whatever charges, whatever charge means, the charges that these operators carry can be canceled by dynamical degrees of freedom of the theory. And that's why this is the natural, the proper way to define completeness here. Um, questions about this? Uh, yeah, I have one. Mm -hmm. um, so other than making the statement of the completeness hypothesis, is there an independent sort of quantum gravity reason why you might expect uh, all extended operators should end? Yes, so that's, that's what I'm gonna be talking about next. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a simple compelling argument for completeness, right? Uh, that as far as I know, uh, this may, may, I apologize if I'm wrong here, but the first time I, that I've seen this is in this paper by, by Harlow, by Daniel Harlow in 2015, uh, which is again related to, to what Shukin was saying, that you can change topology. So you can, so for instance, imagine that, you know, in, in, uh, you have a theory of gravity. And one thing that you can do is you can consider a pair of entangled black holes and via the ER-EPR correspondence, that means that the interiors are joined via a wormhole. So I drew here the conformal diagram of a black hole, of a, of, of a pair of entangled black holes. And so once you do this, uh, there's nothing preventing you from just, you know, writing a Wilson line and threading it through the wormhole. Like that's, that's, that's okay. That's something you can do in the low energy effective field theory in this background. But from the point of view of someone who doesn't know that these things are connected by a wormhole, who's looking at it from the outside, this looks like a Wilson line that ends in black holes. So you expect that lines can end in quantum gravity because of this hard. Okay, uh, so does that sound good? I mean, I'm sort of confused if you have mm -hmm. this statement where you actually have to drag your, your, your U operator to then pass the horizon in this sort of a setup. Oh no no! But I'm not passing the I'm not passing the U operators through the horizon. I'm just threading the Wilson line through the wormhole to argue for this picture, and then I know that the charge operators can end, and then my, my U operators are never going to go through the horizon. They they, they in, in the in the picture that I had before they slide between the two black holes. Okay. Sounds sounds good. Oh, okay. Very good. So that's completeness, and that's global symmetries. And as I said, they are more or less the same thing. They are. They look so much the same thing that, in fact, in Maxwell theory that we were discussing before, they are the same thing. So what I drew here is the is is the the the, the particular phase that you get for the line operators in Maxwell theory, uh, braiding with the topological the electric symmetry operators, and. You can see by just looking at this phase that if you want to have some operator that is non-topological, uh, it better be that the spectrum is not complete. So you don't have Wilson lines for any Q that can end or, or vice versa. So for this particular theory, these two statements are one and the same. Completeness and non-global symmetries are the same. thing. And so the situation that we end up having here is that we have this principle, this, this quantum gravity, blah, blah, that tells us that on one hand, we shouldn't have global symmetries. And on the other hand, the, 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 the spectrum should be complete. But then we have strong suspicions that these two things might actually be the same. In one direction, I think it's pretty clear that it is. Because if you have a complete spectrum of states, then the topological operators cannot link with anyone. And so they basically have to be trivial. So it makes sense that the complete spectrum leads to no global symmetries. But the other implication, although it was obvious in Maxwell theory, is not so obvious in general, okay? 
And so that is the quantum, I promise to you that, the, that, this, that this talk was really a quantum theory talk. So this is the question that we want to understand. We want to understand to which extent completeness and global symmetries are the same thing or not. And even though this is motivated by quantum gravity, it's a completely quantum theory question, okay? So, of course, the, the reason we were able to write um, uh, a whole paper about this is that it is non-trivial to show, and in fact, without some qualifications, this statement is not true in general. So now I'm going to show you an example uh, which shows that this is not true. Um, and um, and, and the, the first time I think uh, this was discussed, or that I'm familiar with it being discussed in the literature, was this very hard work paper with this, this discuss an example with this discrete non abelian group. I'm going to discuss a simpler, ex uh, different example, uh, which is more related to the Maxwell theory that we're talking about, and that's the uh, O2 gauge theory. Uh, so before I do that, any questions about the general logic, completeness, or anything I've seen so far? Yeah, Miguel, can I ask a question? Yes, of course. Uh, I mean, so um, some of these things are very related to it, like Alice strings and, and generalized Alice, Alice objects. I mean, is that going to be um, the sort of thrust of your O2 gauge theory example, or, or is it a separate direction? Yeah, it's going to come. It is, it's still it's still a few slides ahead, but it's and actually, actually, I don't think I wrote it down explicitly on the slides. Um, but yes, so the completeness of the spectrum that we're going to find, the modification of completeness is going to require the presence of Alice strings for O2 gauge theory and similar okay. features for other theories. Yes, yes. Okay, yes. very interesting. Okay, uh, interesting. There's one other feature, though, of those Alice theories, as you know, that if you have a loop, you can also have uh, this very strange phenomena of, of delocalized charge. <laughs> yes. Sir. Like Cheshire charge. So yes. you're also going to find that sometimes the completeness hypothesis is saturated by, by, uh, Delocalized objects as well as local degrees of freedom. I imagine actually not. It's always going to be localized objects. Um, so or can you have something sometimes? I mean, it's a question about what you mean by the state satisfying the completeness hypothesis. After all, we we certainly demand that they, they should be finite energy, correct? You can't take yeah, them. Of course, of course. You can't go to a part of those. But maybe there's other restrictions as well that they have to be objects that are um, sitting yeah. sitting at the card. Like you could you could say also so we are not going to get in there in this talk but I agree with you you could say all sorts of things you could ask that the objects are point like from the point of view of effective field theory right yes, so they're yes, yes, yes. versus so the argument that I gave you is for black holes right yes and Daniel in that paper he spends quite some time trying to trying to push it to you know to black holes being small and the like because then you can really connect it with gravity mm -hmm. uh, so that's mm -hmm. more of a, like a dynamical question yes. and a very interesting one but here I'm mostly focusing on topological stuff which as you will see is complicated enough yes absolutely okay great thank you thank you very much. Okay, good. So O2 gauge theory. So what is O2 gauge theory? It's actually very simple. You take U1 gauge theory, which has a charge conjugation symmetry, which acts on the U1, you have a phase, flips the sign of the phase, and just gauge that. So that's O2 gauge theory. So it's U gauge theory plus gauging charge conjugation. And of course, it's also a matrix group with a familiar prescription here, uh, description, right, in terms of rotation matrices and reflections and the like. Um, so we're going to be talking about operators in this theory, about, and we're not even going to talk about all of them. We're just going to be talking about the electric ones. So I'm going to be talking about Wilson lines and the analog of the topological operators that I was introducing before. So I'm talking about Wilson lines. Then you get a Wilson line for each representation right, in the theory. So what is the representation theory of O2? Well, there's a trivial representation. Uh, the determinant representation, which is actually the joint that represents this matrix trivially and this matrix by a sign. And then this is other guy, which is just the usual rotation representation, which is a Q-fold cover. We just put a Q in front of the angle here. Okay. So <clears throat> you have, of course, Wilson lines for all these representations. And it's very, they're actually super, these guys, the, the ones for the, for the two-dimensional representations are super easy to construct. If you take the point of view, this is U1 gauge theory plus gauging of charge conjugation. Because what do you do when you gauge a symmetry? Well, you just find the gauge invariant combinations of the stuff in the parent theory. So that's how you can construct this Wilson line as a sum of two Wilson lines of the parent U1 theory of charges Q and minus Q because they are, you know, related by charge conjugation. But just like, you know, it's familiar from two dimensional CFTs and warships. Uh, you can also get other lines, uh, which come, which are not coming in a simple way from stuff from the parent theory, like the determinant line. Okay. Good. 
Um, so those are the Wilson lines. And we can also define the, the topological operators. And I just told you how to do it. You start with the U1 ones and then you just find invariant combinations. There are more topological operators. There's one more that I haven't discussed here and will show up later. And it's related to the Alice strings, actually. Uh, but for the time being, let's just focus on these two guys, which you can get just by finding invariant combinations like this. Well, if you write this, then you say the, the first the first thing that comes to mind is to think, oh, this is going to have a U1 uh, one form global symmetry, just like Maxwell theory has. And indeed, these operators are topological, even when you take into account correlation functions with operators from twisted sectors. However, um, they are uh, not invertible. Okay, um, so that's that's uh, that's 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 a very important difference. They are not invertible. And you can see this very simply because you can just take the product of these two guys with this formula, expand, right? It's just the cosine of the twice the angle, right? And you just get this kind of thing. So the operators, the, 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 these operators, they generally do not have an inverse. And for this particular case, even though it's not obvious here, there's no way to fix this. These guys are not invertible. So they are not really a one from global symmetry. There's the other guy, of course, this the T sub pi. This guy squares to the identity. So that one is invertible. So that one generates a Z2 one form global symmetry. Bottle line O2 theory has a Z2 one form global symmetry. Okay. Questions about this? Okay. Well, we have a Z2 one form symmetry. And the braiding of the topological operators that I have here with the lines is the same as in Maxwell theory. Um, with the Wilson line on the representation of two dimensional representation of charge Q. And here you see the problem. Suppose that I pick a spectrum where I say that only Wilson lines whose charges are multiple of three are end. Okay, so you just take three of the, 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 the Wilson line of charge one is unbreakable, but if you have the charge three, six, nine, whatever, then you can break it. That's not clearly an incomplete spectrum because you're missing the Wilson line of charge one, but because three is an odd number, and this is a Z2 form symmetry. Now, this operator is braiding with, uh, with, a, with a breakable Wilson line, with an endable Wilson line. And so the symmetry, the Z2 one form global symmetry, is broken. So it's just not true. You can have an incomplete spectrum and still no global symmetries. So that's how it is with the standard definition that we have. But remember, we still have a bunch of topological operators that we were not really using in, in all of this, right? So we have all of the other guys. And so there's a very strong temptation to, to think that these guys are a part of the story. And indeed, what's, what's going to happen is that by generalizing the notion of symmetry to allow for non-invertible guys, we'll see that this correspondence is restored in this particular example. OK, so I need to introduce what a non-invertible symmetry is. Um, uh, and I just have, basically I've copied the slide that I had before about a global symmetry, about the P form global symmetries uh, to emphasize that it's basically the same thing. The only thing that really changes is, is this idea. So you have a set of operators, okay? And, uh, and they don't satisfy a group law, but still if you have these topological operators and you fuse them, you should still get a topological operator. So you should get a more general structure where when fusing, you fuse two of them, you produce uh, a bunch of the others. So that's, uh, that's, that's what you, you might call a fusion algebra. And it's, uh, it's, it's a familiar structure from, from, from the OP of, of, of two dimensional CFTs. Um, but that's basically the one difference. Uh, you still have charge operators localized on p dimensions of manifolds and correlators of the operators are topological. And the, and the, the linking coefficient here now is not just, it's just not just given simply in terms of representation theory, of course, you have to work harder to compute it. But you know, other than that is pretty similar. And I'm gonna take questions about this in a moment. Let me just say that there's one natural generalization of this, which won't play a role or too much of a role in this talk, uh, which is to, to generalize the, in this algebra here. There's no good reason why all the operators that show up in the algebra should all have the same, should be supporting in manifolds of the same dimension. Maybe you fuse the surfaces and get a line. That's something that could happen. And, and so the natural thing, is to have to talk about non-invertible higher form symmetries. Uh, questions about this, please. Does the algebra have to be associative? Um, yes. Well, I mean, by, by construction, right? This is um, 
Um, yeah, is this the most general thing? I'm thinking of, for example, like in string field theory, where something might be associative up to homotopy. Um, uh, well, the, the, this this I really don't know. This I it, this I have no I have no good answer to. So the argument that this is associative, right, is like when you're fusing things, you can just fuse one and the other, and uh, or the other way around. Uh, Right, right. So if you have three operators, right, and then you look, right. So you can look at how they how they correlate with something else which is far away, right. That sh shouldn't matter if you fuse this one first with this other one and the other one with the other, right. So that's how this is associated. So then, how would string field theory fit into this picture? Um, uh, honestly, I have no idea. This I haven't thought about. So, so maybe you can explain a bit more, like how. Uh, well, in string field theory, I guess things are non-local, right? So the, the argument that things, the, the argument that I was using is really was using locality. So maybe that's an ingredient, uh, but I don't really know. Okay, okay. So since we're restricting to field quantum field theory, then probably it's, yeah. Okay, got it. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now that we have these guys, uh, this is great. Um, uh, because now we, we have fixed the definition so as to fix our conjecture. Um, with, because with Google's three matter, these some of these operators, these topological operators, we generate an uninvertible symmetry. They're still topological, so they still generate symmetry. We have restored things. So this is nice. And this is the picture that we believe uh, is true in general. Okay, that when you have non invertible symmetries, if you're able to study all the non invertible operators, you're going to find that this is an only if that you have non-invertible non symmetries if the spectrum is, is complete. However, we're not able to prove it in general because talking about this non-invertible symmetries in general, it's a mess, it's a complicated business. The best thing, the next best thing that we could do is that we could prove it for a particular case of symmetries like the ones that we've been talking about. Symmetries in which the charge operators are Wilson lines, that's what we call electric symmetries for a gauge theory but with an arbitrary compact gauge group G. And when I say arbitrary but compact, that's what I mean. I mean, I also allow these connected groups like O2. So I'm not going to tell you what is the general argument. And, and, uh, and to tell that, I need to introduce a little bit of notation. So we're gonna be talking about the same operators that we'll be talking about in O2 theory, but I need to discuss them a little bit more abstractly because also because I'm gonna be doing things in D dimensions. Um, so the charge operators that you have in pure theory, the, the, that we're going to be talking about are the Wilson lines, they're dimension one operators. And for them to be able to link, they link with stuff which is called dimension two. The topological operators that we talked about, in general, they're called book of Witten operators. Now, Wilson lines are just the holonomy of the gauge field in a curve and in a given representation. How do you construct book of Witten operators in general? Because the construction that I, the explicit construction that I used was very particular to U1. So in general, you do them, you, you, you define them by um, excising this co-dimension two manifold and prescribing conditions for the bound, for the gauge fields on the, the transverse circle. So you excise co-dimension two, there's a transverse circle. You specify conditions on the, on the gauge field. So you got to specify a gauge bundle on a circle. And very generally, gauge bundles on a circle are classified, they're labeled by conjugacy classes of the group. Right, because you need to pick a gauge transformation, but you're taking, you need to take into account that the disconnected part of the gauge group can act by conjugation and can change that. So they're basically labeled by a conjugacy class. Um, both of them have very physical interpretations. For the Wilson lines, as we discussed, the word volume of a broad particle. And for the Google Witten operators, you can actually think of them as the word volume of probe magnetic flux tubes, right? But this is actually an important question. Like suppose that an experimentalist colleague of yours tells you that he wants to measure, he or she wants to measure correlators of operators in, in, in his lab. How would you do it? Well, to put a Wilson line, you just put a wire with electric charge in it. And to put a Google with an operator, you will introduce a flux tube, a magnet, which has confined magnetic flux, but still generates a non-trivial holonomy of the gauge field outside of it. And, um, uh, so that's that's the, that's the, the analogy between these two things. And one more important point is that even in pure gauge theory, there's going to be a Wilson line that can break. The John Wilson line that will always be able to break um, because uh, because you always have charged matter in, in the joint representation in pure gauge theory. Okay. Uh, 
uh, so these are the operators. And now I'm going to give you the fusion between the two of them pretty generally. This is the formula that generalizes the one I wrote before for, for global symmetries. Um, it involves um, these quantities uh, where chi of rho is the character of rho in the conjugacy class of G. So this is basically just the, the trace of the matrix in, in, in representation given by G. Okay. So th this, this, is the, this is the linking coefficient in general for these theories. And as we were saying before, when a Wilson line doesn't link with, uh, we were saying before that a Wilson line doesn't think with a global symmetry operator when it's just transparent to it. The analog of being transparent here is that, oops, it's that the numerator here, this character is equal to the character of the identity. That's what it means that the operator is transparent. Uh, questions about this? Okay, good. So remember the basic idea that we have. If an operator links with an endable Wilson line, if a group of Witten operators is with this, it's not topological. And this has already a very simple consequence, which is that all group of Witten operators were, um, uh, which, which don't satisfy, which, which link non-trivially with the general representation are gonna be non-topological just because you have gluons. So all of those guys are already non-topological. We, we don't need to talk about them. Uh, but still, there's a non-trivial question. We want to understand if, the, um, if, uh, if, if, if completeness of the, of the spectrum of this, uh, of, of the spectrum of Wilson lines is the same as saying that there's no topological Google within operators. So what we want to prove really here is that you can have topological Google within operators. That is to say, operators that satisfy this equation for all n double Wilson lines row. What we want to prove is that this thing can only happen if the spectrum is incomplete. If the set of all representations is missing some sides, okay. So that's what we want to prove. Uh, is it clear why we want to prove it? Um, okay, then I'm gonna give you the proof. <laughs> okay, so this is an only if and only if statement. So it has two directions, right? So first, let's first assume that the set of endable Wilson lines is complete. Okay, if the self enable Wilson lines is complete, that means that for any representation whatsoever, you have uh, uh, the corresponding Wilson line ends. And in particular, I can choose a finite dimensional faithful representation of the group, which is something I can do because the group is compact. And uh, when the group is compact, uh, uh, you, have a faithful, you have a faithful representation like this, then the, it's a property of a faithful representation that the characters are never equal to the characters of the identity. Uh, simply because this only happens if, if the matrix representation that you're using uh, for, for the conjugacy class of G is basically the identity. So that proves it uh, in one direction. To prove it the other direction, you can assume that there's an incomplete set of Wilson lines. Okay, so you don't have all of them. Then if you don't have all of them, it better be the case that uh, you cannot find a faithful representation among the Wilson lines that you can generate by fusion of Wilson lines. So uh, if you think of Wilson lines as probe particles, right? You put them together, um, they're gonna, uh, they, they, they're gonna, when they fuse, they're gonna produce more Wilson lines in representations given by the, the composition into a reps of the tensor product of the two Wilson lines you started with. So starting with some set of Wilson lines, you can produce more Wilson lines. And I claim that in this way, you are never gonna be able to find a faithful representation because there's another theorem that tells you that faithful representations can generate all the representations via tensor products. So that would be in contradiction with assuming that it's incomplete. But then that basically means that the set of representations that we have is not faithful. Like there's not a single faithful representation in there. And by definition of what a faithful representation is, that means that there's some group element G such that for any end double line is represented by the identity matrix. But then I just take characters in this equation and I get there's a topological operator, okay? So this is an if and only if uh, proof of these two statements, okay? Questions about this? Okay, good. So I gave you a proof that um, completeness of the spectrum and absence of Google of Witten, of, topo of, of, of uh, topological Witten operators is, um, is true in pure gauge theory coupled to matter. 
but one thing that I use heavily in the proof is that the group is compact, okay? This proof breaks down if you have non-compact groups. Um, and and it's, this, is, this is nice because we also don't expect to have non-compact groups in quantum gravity. This is because they typically lead themselves uh, to global symmetries. So it's nice that this equivalence between these two things is um, not, it's not, um, it's not present precisely in the cases that arise in quantum gravity. So an example of this is R gauge theory, where you can have topological operators uh, and charge operators, just like in Maxwell theory. So this is like Maxwell theory, only that the gauge group has been replaced by the real numbers. So these two things take value in the real, in the real numbers. And when you do it like this, you can take a charge, which is, you can say that, for instance, consider a spectrum where the only particle has charge square root of two, then you're never going to be able to generate a state which has charge one. So the spectrum is incomplete. And yet, no one form survives. So the proof that we used, uh, that, we, that, that I illustrated before, really uses compactness of the gauge group. OK? Now, electric operators means that the Google Witten operators are not topological. Um, but it turns out that one fun thing that we can do is reverse roles. So we can trade Google Witten operators by Wilson lines and think of some of the Wilson lines as generators of an uninvertible uh, symmetry and under which the Google Witten operators are charged. Um, and this is because there are some Wilson lines, not all of them, but some Wilson lines in some gauge theories are topological. So they generate uh, this symmetry. So how does that happen? How does a Wilson line uh, become, topolo uh, become topological? Well, they only exist for disconnected gauge groups, like go to, and they only exist for representations that, that represent the identity component of the gauge group trivially. Okay? So, for instance, uh, uh, so, so for instance, in O2, that's the determinant representation. And th th we have proofs of these statements in the paper, but this is something that you can actually understand very intuitively. If you take the picture that a Wilson line that I drew here is the probe, is, is the, is the, is the, is the um, word volume of a probe particle. Now, when you have a probe particle, which has, let's say, electric charge, of course, it's sourcing some field strength, it's sourcing some field lines. And that means that the operator is not really topological in a very natural way, because it's, you know, it's sourcing electrostatic fields. So if you move the line a little bit, it's like moving a chart. So of course, the electric field is changing. So of course, it's non topological. But there are Wilson lines for disconnected gauge groups, like the determinant line or uh, or the um, or the or the or the or the, or the, or the Wilson lines in in ZN gauge theory, which is the same as BF gauge theory, which do not source long range gauge fields. And if you don't source long range uh, field strengths, then the lines can be topological, and they often are. Um, so these topological Wilson lines are classified by uh, uh, by by zero of G by the zero homotopy group. Um, simply because they represent the identity component trivially. And in general, they generate a D minus two uh, non-invertible symmetry, okay? The charge states, we're reversing roles. So now the charge states are the group of Witten operators. Um, so same, so the completeness is gonna tell you now that the group of Witten operators have to end if you wanna avoid having a non-invertible symmetry. Um, so what are the endable group of Witten operators? Um, they're, they're just like in, in pure gauge theory, some Wilson lines, the ones in the agenda representation, they automatically can end. The Google Witten operators have a similar property, and you can show that those four conjugacy classes in the identity component can end automatically. So you don't need to talk about them. But to make the rest of them endable, you need to introduce dynamical objects. And in fact, I, I don't have the proof here, but we proved a similar statement that this is an if and only if statement, existence of twists, strings, a complete spectrum of twist uh, vortices for strings only exists if, um, if this, if this non-invertible symmetry is completely broken. Um, and, and so you need to introduce uh, dynamical objects that are created when one of the go-within operators ends. And this is the Alice string. In the, going back to the case of O2 theory, this is the Alice string that John was talking about. So for O2 theory, there is a Wilson line in the determinant representation, which is topological. And it links a Google Witten operator that I didn't write before, uh, which is the Google Witten operator corresponding of the conjugacy to the conjugacy class of reflections in O2. 
making this operator and this operator basically is introducing the word volume of a probe Alice string. And saying that the operator can end means that you allow the Alice string to become non dynamic. And the point here is that the story is far more general. Uh, it applies for any invertible symmetry. Uh, uh, questions about this? I have a trivial comment. Uh, yes. So I assume you, you, throughout the talk, you assume G to be a continuous group? Yes, in general, yes. OK, because the first sentence is not quite right for discrete G, right? For discrete G, of course, you can have topological Wilson lines. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, sorry, Shukin, but then the, the, the statement is still correct, right? Like, uh, oh, oh, I see. I see. I see. Yes. Yes, yeah, sorry. I guess yes. the adjective disconnected doesn't make <laughs> yes, sense. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, I was only complaining about the word only. Okay, okay, okay. okay. And then it's a it's a <laughs> trivial comment. Yeah. No, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, oh, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. hey, Juman. Hi. Can you clarify what you mean by a uh, twisted here or twist string? This is two dimensional operator surface operator. Yes, very good. So the Google within operators have co dimension. Let, let, let let's think in four dimensions for concreteness. Okay. Um, so, so then they are there. The Google Boolean operators are co-dimension two, right? So they they are they are they are operators that insert uh, the word volume of a probe two-dimensional object like a string, okay? And and the twist here means what oh, was the emphasis of twist here? Oh yeah. Oh sorry. The the, the that's just the the name we give to the physical states that you get once you end up. You and uh, you know to the physical states that you get once you make the corresponding Google within operators endable. It's just a name. Uh, the name comes from the fact that these are, these things are twist. The, the people call them twi twist vortices or twist strings, or sometimes they are you know they're they're examples of cosmic strings. The thing that defines them physically is that if you find this object floating around in space, and you take a charged particle and go around it, the charged particle is going to come back at you with an action of the of the corresponding Bonding symmetry, invertible or non-invertible? Okay. Uh, right. So it's kind of like twisted. Okay. okay. So that's a phase or a twist. By the symmetry. It's a twist. Right. But the Alice string gives you, you know, charge conjugates things and produces charge somewhere else. This is the non-local charge that John was talking about, right? So it, it, they, they can do very interesting things. Okay. So, yeah, very good. So this is the story, basically. The things that we prove, we prove electric completion, twist vortex completion with, for pure Gibbs theory coupled to matter. And I was, I was careful to say pure Gibbs theory coupled to matter because more generally things are difficult to do. Uh, first of all, I didn't talk about magnetic symmetries. I didn't talk about tough lines and the analog of the Google within operators for the tough lines because they, this, these operators are um, difficult to construct and analyze. Like for instance, the, some, the, the, the symmetries are, are very non-invertible and difficult to study. But even without going to fancy cases, you can already see that in some cases where electric and magnetic symmetries mix, our arguments don't hold. So an example, a particularly interesting example of this is axial electrodynamics. So we are back at Maxwell's theory, and we just couple it to an axiom like this. OK, you just have these things. And by adding this coupling, the one form symmetry is explicitly broken because the current, the divergence of the current no longer vanishes. So it's just, it's just broken. Um, so there's no one form symmetry, no electric one form symmetry. But nevertheless, the Wilson lines, uh, we, we, we proved that the Wilson lines in this theory are not endable. There's, there's no way to, to end them. So there's a mismatch between completeness and, uh, and, uh, and, and absence of global symmetry in this theory. You might ask, what, where did the proof go wrong here? Well, it went wrong because we are basically assuming something which is true in pure gauge theory, which is that the only way that the topological, uh, the Google within operator stops being topological is by linking with an endable Wilson line. In these more general theories, they can link with other stuff. And that's kind of what's happening. But even in this case, where our proof doesn't apply, our version of the statement is still true. This theory has other operators. This is the topological operator that generates tough lines. And this is an operator that uh, the generates a one, the, the, the three form global symmetry to the strings, uh, to, the, to the action strings coming from five. And to, you know, they're genuinely topological in the theory that I described. So to render them non topological, we must introduce action strings and monopoles. 
And in this theory, once you have the action strings and the monopoles, you also have electrically charged states. So the Wilson lines that couldn't end before now can end. This is something we get for free, thanks to the Witten effect. OK? So uh, in this case, even though we don't have a general proof, we need to do it more artisanally. You still have the, you, you still, this is still true that the action strings, uh, it is still true that you get a, if you start, if you demand that there's no global symmetries, you get a complete spectrum. Okay. So in all the examples that we know so far, it is true that the completeness hypothesis is the same as absence of non-invertible global symmetries, not topological or, or, or saying basically there's not topological operators in the theory. This idea, completeness and non-global symmetries, was, uh, was, was originated in, in this paper by Shuheng and Tom Rodelius, uh, in which they were able to prove it uh, for, for, some, for some theories in three dimensions, uh, but in full generality. Um, so that's the basic uh, uh, that's that's the basic picture that we like to that we like to see if it's true in general or not. And I would like to end with some motivation, some very general motivation for the absence of topological operators in quantum gravity. Like for the completeness hypothesis we discussed, you can just thread the line through the wormhole, and uh, you know that's that that seems pretty natural in general to me. Um, but there's also uh, a motivation, which actually it, it comes from this paper again, uh, to having non topological operators in quantum gravity. So one of the first things that we all, I think we all agree on about what gravity is and what gravity has and has not is that gravity should have uh, no local operators because of different orbits and invariants. If you try to write down phi of x, that is not different orbits and invariant. So you need to fix it somehow. You need to make the operator non-local. Uh, so that it's attached to some sort of perhaps a gravitational Wilson line to some sort of boundary or, or some of the story. Um, but there's no local operators. In a sense, there's a loophole to this argument because, well, I mean, not really a loophole, but uh, what if you have a local operator or a localized operator, maybe it's not completely local, it lives on a surface or something, but it's still pretty localized. You have an operator like that, uh, but which is invariant on the small deformations. In short, it's topological. Then, you don't really care where you inserted it. So it's different morphism invariant with, without you having to attach to anything far away. So this argument shows that uh, it suggests that perturbative gravity is okay with topological operators by different morphism invariance. But there is very ample evidence right now, so Shukin was actually uh, hinting at the start of the talk, I think. Um, it's, it's also very natural to say uh, that there, there's, there's no topological operators in quantum gravity because topology itself is dynamic. Because in full quantum gravity, the topology itself fluctuates, right? So if the topology is fluctuating, then it's, it's not very clear uh, how to even define a topological operator in the first place. Um, so if even topological operators are, they, they don't have to be well defined, uh, the topology itself is dynamic. Um, um, and we have plenty of evidence for this, right? Coming from uh, some of our silos in Euclidean quantum gravity, ADS CFT, um, uh, entanglement and, and, and black holes. So it's, it's a very natural motivation for this term. So with this, I'm finished. Uh, just what is the take home message here? Take home message is that we strongly believe that the completeness of the spectrum, these two swampling constraints are appropriately formulated in a way that uh, it, 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 it's actually perhaps even more general, from, or more natural from the quantum variety point of view. Completeness of the spectrum is equivalent to having no topological operators. We couldn't prove it in general, but we could prove it in these two cases. And the particular case of twist vortex completeness is pretty interesting because it tells you that um, you must have uh, these, these twist strings in the spectrum. Uh, and, and so they could be there, they could be relevant for cosmology. Like for instance, you have, uh, I don't know, uh, there are models of twin Higgs where you have uh, copies of the of the of the standard model, like several copies of the standard model, and you might imagine that there's a gauge transformation swapping the two of them. That's an outer automorphism. That's a gauge transformation, and we are predicting there should be a twist string for a guy like that. So uh, such that if you you know you, you send a particle come, uh, on on one side, on the other side, the twin particle comes out. And so that's the basic idea. Um, and of course, the thing we'd like to understand. Uh, is how to do this more generally involving magnetic symmetries, electric symmetries, and, you know, stuff. So. And with this, I thank you for your attention and I'm finished.
Okay, let's thank uh, Miguel for a great talk. Uh, so you can, okay, I see lots of clapping hands and so uh, yeah, let's open it up for questions. So questions for Miguel, just feel free to shout out. Uh, I have a question about maybe the previous slide. Mm -hmm. The second statement. So yes. the, oh, actually, sorry, the next one. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, so as you know, there is this 4D Z2 cross Z2 gauge theory, <laughs> yes. right? And that's kind of a counterexample to, to the second bullet point. And the reason is because um, the surface operator in 4D can cease to be topological via the triple linking, which is something that Juven is also very familiar with. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I assume in the second point, bullet point, you have to add more assumptions for that statement to be true. So, right, exactly, exactly. So that's why we were careful about the statements that we're putting, precisely because of this example, as you know. Right. So what we prove this is, we present is that if you have pure gaze theory, okay, and, 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 and charge matter, well, you're right. So if, if, if the, the, the first statement, it's true for pure gaze theory and charge matter. For the second one, um, uh, we need to forget about the about the about the triple link and that kind of thing. So that is uh, that is true. Um, I think it's I think it's similar to the to the case in Maxwell theory, right? It's, you you can have more operators than they can they can talk to each other in non-trivial ways. I think you, you, I don't think you can forget about the triple okay. link. Right? That that's some correlation function that's just there. I, I thought what you would like to assume is that the surface of the book of Witten surface operators cannot end on certain strings. So I think you need to assume the absence of certain dynamical strings in your theory. Right, of course, right. So if we say that the, 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 the surface that can link with these two cannot end, right? right then right. we're forced to say that it has to be the book of Witten operators, right? right? But I agree with you that from this point of view, it's like an artificial. Right, and that assumption, yeah, I don't think that assumption is easy to make, right? Because even in a weekly couple print, you wouldn't know if there are some very heavy dynamical strings. I, that... I, I, I agree. I, I, right. I, I agree. I agree. Right. 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 Yeah. yeah. Um, That's a very subtle counterexample. No, no, no. But it's, it's good. And I actually, I think it's a very good counterexample. And I think it has yeah. to do a lot with the, to me at least, morally, it's very similar to the action electrical dynamics example. Right. Uh, where you just, you know, you just change the Lagrangian. You didn't do anything super weird. And there you go. Uh, the, arg the argument doesn't work. So the assumption that we make, right, that is that this operator, the basic assumption that fails, is that we say that these operators can only be topological, uh, can, can only fail to be topological if they link with an open, with a Wilson line that can open. So right. that's the yeah. thing that fails in both the examples. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. More questions from Miguel. Miguel, can I can I make a phenomenological point? Please, please. So, so, um, sorry to bring, um, so that your the twist vortex completeness is very interesting. I mean, so I think I think it's true to say that when you have um, a continuous component here, where the twist vortex um, is acting on, then that implies that such cosmic strings have to be superconducting. And, and the physics of superconducting cosmic strings is extremely rich and probably gives you very striking, if they existed near the universe and weren't inflated away, probably there's very striking signatures with such, such things. There's been recent investigations by, by various groups, but also I think this goes back to, to the 80s by various people who were thinking in the late 80s right. about superconducting strings. And of course, famously, Ed Witten himself. There's, there's a tremendous amount of, of interesting stuff to do there. So actually it would be nice to understand how general this twist vortex construction is. But. Very good. And this is actually a super fun question to, to work on uh, because the, the reason why the strings are superconducting in simple examples is uh, in a sense is because of anomaly inflow, right? You have- Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The fault, yes. So you need to have something that cancels the anomaly. So, yeah. so you, you were saying that this is a phenomenological question, but I would say that it's also a very interesting formal one because it's yeah. talking about inflow of non-invertible symmetries on these guys. No I idea agree. about that, would love to understand better. Yeah, it sounds very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree. More questions? Let, excuse me. Yes, Miguel. please go ahead. Sorry, I, I ask a question. I think same follow up to an ask because actually I also asked the same same one when uh, Jack. <laughs> yes. <laughs> McMara 
discuss that, but I just want to hear what's the modification of statement you make. Suppose in a theory, there are non-trivial correlation function of extent operators that the link invariants are not from just two of the operator are linked, but multi-operator link, for example, triple link, as mm -hmm. the Shohan say, or quadruple link, any high dimension, yeah. there are more complicated links. Yes, so yes. one interpretation for that kind of linking link invariant is that there are some measurement, just like some symmetry, like measurement by topological operator, such that the measurement is due to a, a non-trivial kind of a charge, a trap between some uh, low uh, links. For example, Borromean ring can be viewed as a uh, 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 three of the S1 circle linked, but they only link when one of S1 uh, I understand. Uh, like it, 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 you, take, you, know, so, so yeah, you can you can think about yeah, like two uh, some kind of a ch charge trouble between two of S one circle, but can only be measured when you have a third third S one string uh, circle. Yeah. So what what would you describe those type of statement or modification when you try to make those type of proof? I I, I don't think the Jack spell out this directly, or at least I didn't understand when he answered. I don't know whether you can try it again. Very good. Very good answer for that. Thank you. So I'm not sure I can be uh, I, I I can explain it better than Jake because the the the, the answer that I have is that um, it, it's certainly out of the framework of the two things that we proved as as, as I told as I told Shuken, right so what if we for instance for the triple link in the C2C2 theory for our proof to work we just need to say oh, okay fine there's this operator but we're just gonna say this one is not gonna break up so we don't talk about it right so that's a very artificial restriction. And uh, and um, I agree in general. You, you need to take um, all of this into account. So the point is that if the point is that if you start talking about these other operators and these extra um, and these more complicated links, you also need to talk. There's probably additional non-invertible symmetries different from the ones generated by Google Witten operators or the polygonal Wilson lines that we talked about. And you need to take into account those, right? So the picture would be that talking about those and saying that um, that the um, uh, and then the, the, the question that we would like to answer and to see if it's true is that whether taking into account all of the non-invertible symmetry of the theory and saying that no topological operators need to remain, that is the same as saying that the spectrum is incomplete. Uh, but that's that's just basically the, the, the last point I put in conclusions. So I don't think I can give you a, I, I, on, to be short, I cannot give you a good answer because I don't know. I, I would expect that in these examples, there's additional Invertible symmetry, non-invertible symmetries that one needs to take into account, but uh, but I cannot really be more specific about it because I haven't thought about it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, more questions from Miguel. Don't see anybody asking anything. Um. Hmm. I'm tempted to ask one, but we're kind of late already. Uh, but <laughs> uh, can you say a little bit more about um, magnetic symmetries in particular? The, I mean, usually what one often talks about like, uh, you know, S dualities or things like this as a way of providing a constraint on, you know, yes. both electric and magnetic degrees of freedom. So um, how do such transformations uh, enter your story here? Yes, so I was avoiding uh, right magnetic symmetries. Uh, yes. Because most of the interesting story here, right, uh, comes from from um, from from gauge groups that have uh, that are like O2 that are disconnected, have like more than one connected component, and uh, and so it's very difficult to, to to I don't I don't think I know how to do it in general to 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 work out the story about the topological operators for the um, uh, you know for the, the analog of the Google Witten operators for the magnetic symmetry, right? So there's two ways you could try and define a tough line, okay? If you try to define the tough line uh, uh, directly in the case that you started with, uh, with the usual description, we just ex excise an S2 and put an H bundle there and uh, you know it's classifying. So they are classified by phi one of G. Um, then morally speaking, the topological operators, they should live in the bondrag in dual of this thing, um, right? Well, yeah. the, that, that works for continuous for, 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 a, for a connected Lie group. When the group is disconnected, the, the, this because you need to you need to act by the action of the conjugation on uh, when describing the bundles on the circle. So they're classified by pi one uh, of, of G modulo the action of pi zero. The bond that that thing is not a group, so it doesn't have a point. It's kind of like a pondering dual of something which is not a group. It's just yelling non-invertible from the get-go in a complicated way. 
So that is not the nicest way to think about this. There's another way you can think about tough lines, uh, which is, let's just go, as you were saying, let's just go to the S-dual, right? Yeah. And let's talk about loosened lines of the S-dual. Yeah. Well, here you have the problem. You need to find the Langlands dual for a disconnected. Uh, what is the Langlands dual of O2? And we actually, for O2, we have some ideas uh, what the Langlands, we have some evidence what the Langlands dual might be. Um, by thinking a little bit, because for, uh, we can understand all the magnetic, uh, for, for that particular example, we can understand the magnetic lines in the paper. And they, they, they seem to fall in representations of um, pin minus two. Okay. Yeah. So you know, uh, that may, maybe that's what the Langlands dual of that thing is. Uh, but my, what I'm saying is that I'm, I don't know what the answer is in general. So it involves to, to answer this question involves one or two complicated directions. Either this contracting dual of something uh, of, of this thing, which is not even a group, or more promisingly, work out s duality for disconnected groups. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Great. Uh, let's see. We had a lot of questions. Um, doesn't look like anybody's. This is your last chance if you want to ask them. You can also drop me an email. <laughs> but it's yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, let's thank Miguel one more time for a great talk and for answering all these great questions. Uh, okay, thanks a lot, everyone, for coming and thanks for the invitation again. It was fun. Yep. Yeah. So thanks. And